I had no idea that it would run for, you know, a whole episode, let alone six series. It's been a phenomenal success, which has been a huge surprise to us. I remember thinking oh, I'd love a part in that, and uh, it was a dream come true when I got cast eventually. It's a nice one to play. It's great work. It really is good work. It's, I mean, it's, it's top-rate television. I'd been working on an oil rig, uh, researching a drama series I was writing called Roughnecks, and I was getting sick of the smell of diesel oil and the constant noise. I was living in the Arctic Circle, where it was light 24 hours a day, and I was just thinking, God, you know, I would so love to be back in Kerry, where my father used to take us on holidays every year when we were kids. and. Um, it, it, it just grew from, from that would be nice to, well, why don't you write about it, which is the next best thing. So I just remembered some of the characters and um, then started embellishing them and inventing them. But it was still just an indulgence. I didn't honestly think anyone would be that interested in it. I must say I've been as surprised as, well, most other people claim to be at the success of it. I remember reading the initial scripts and uh, I wasn't quite sure what would, would happen with the show. We were all kind of unsure of, of what the end product would be. When I read the, 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 the spec, the sort of outline for the series before we began, I remember thinking, they must be joking, this isn't going to work, this is, you know, the mid-90s. No one's going to swallow this because this sort of Ireland just doesn't exist anymore. But then hearing that people like Tony Doyle and Neil Topin um, and Stephen Tompkinson uh, were, were playing some of the central characters, thought this is actually going to be OK. Initially, my character just came in for, I think, a, a couple of weeks in the first, in the first uh, series. And, um, I, you know, it was just a once-off as far as I was concerned. But then I was rather surprised when series two came up and um, the contract was a little longer and then series three was a little longer again. <laughs> the original English director, Richard Stand, even, before the first one even went out, said, you know, in four years' time, you're still going to be wearing that clerical collar. It's now six years later, <laughs> and I'm still wearing it, so he knew more than anybody else for some reason. Well, I got the name Balakas Angel from uh, a, a small place in County Kerry, uh, near where my father was born called Balakasan. And I knew I couldn't call it Balakasan because it's a real place. But I always liked the sound of the name. It always sounded so romantic. Um, I had no idea what it meant. Um, and in fact, it has nothing to do with kissing at all. I believe the Gaelic root of the word is Balia, which means town. Quishk, uh, which means apparently banished. And Anne, I guess, means Anne. So, a long time ago, somebody called Anne was banished from this small place. This is Bally Kiss Angel. This is it. So, Bally Kiss Angel means the town of the banished angel. Um, he says confidently, uh, hoping that no one out there will say, no, it isn't. It's beautiful. You're made for each other. What I wanted to do was to explore the collision between people's perceptions of rural Ireland and the reality. It, it's not a place any longer, rural Ireland, where people go around tugging their forelocks to the local priest. It doesn't work like that now. And I thought that was interesting. Um, it's the kind of place where, you know, all the kids have the right trainers and they speak, they speak the language of NYPD blue, but in a Kerry accent. And that's funny, but it's also... Uh, it's also got great potential for drama, I think. I needed an outsider to come in to really, to properly explore it. And, and it happened to be a priest, but it could just as easily have been a, a butcher or a bookmaker. But the priest gives you forbidden love and it gives you moral dilemmas. I suppose like any fiction, it's sort of a version of the way things could be, maybe, um, or maybe should be, but 
no realism. It didn't do. I think also there's a slight touch of nostalgia about it, that it's the Ireland that a lot of people remember. And when I say remember, I'm talking about so, 10 years ago. You know, it hasn't changed as much as other places. Irish people who live abroad or immigrants and stuff were really, it sort of reminded them of some type of way of living that we did have here maybe back in the 70s or whatever. It's, it sort of, you know, reminded me of when I was a kid, the way little towns in Ireland were. But I think that's, that sort of place is long gone, unfortunately. And a lot of Irish people, when they live abroad in, uh, in America and in Canada and Australia and everything, you know, just bring the memories back to them, you know, what it was when they left. And that will make them to come back home, reminds them, you know, what, what is their roots. It's a quaint, quizzical type of program. I wouldn't say it exactly represents uh, Irish life or the village here, uh, but um, it seems to have engaged the interest of people all over the world. Hi there, we're from South Africa and we love Bellicus Angel. I'm from Boston and I love Bellicus Angel. We're from Belgium and we watch Bellicus Angel. It's on Sunday nights at 7.30 on the ABC in Australia and a lot of people sit down and watch it. I think when you watch it, if you live in Australia or America, you think, yeah, I recognise those people. They may have different accents, but I have been in that situation, or I recognise that situation. Um, and it's not that surprising, you know. I mean, we, we love some of the American stuff we get o o over here in Ireland or, or, or in England. And uh, we don't like it because it's American. We like it because it's universal. They just happen to speak with American accents, but so what? You know those people, uh, you've met those people, you've perhaps been those people, you are those people, or you, you recognize the situations they're in. Siobhan in the first series was um, quite a wild, mountainy woman. Uh, that's the way the character was described to me. Uh, she was supposed to be someone who drank a lot with the, the men in the bar, who um, didn't really care about her appearance, uh, had no relationships, but was very dedicated to her animals, to the animals that uh, she tended as a vet. I think since then she has developed more relationships with people, certainly with uh, Brendan, who is the school teacher. That relationship kind of happened by accident in a way. Uh, Siobhan was drunk one night and Brendan came along to console her and um, things progressed. And somehow out of that was uh, born a relationship which has survived. Paul Dooley is a shyster. He's a, he's a former counsellor. Actually, he was called Sean in the very first series. And, um, and then the second series was called Sean. And then he was arrested and he came out as Paul. I guess while he was in prison, another character was introduced into the series called Sean Dillon. So if you had Sean Dooley and Sean Dillon, Got a bit confusing, I suppose. Una was described to me as feisty when I first went for the interview, and um, she has to be really because Paul leads her merry dance. Um, she spends a lot of her time trying to contain him and uh, stop him from getting too carried away with his wheeling and dealing. Um, it's a very true relationship, I think, as far as husbands and wife go. So, you know, and they, 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 they seem to have a good relationship with their kids. Owen and I often say it's like an Italian relationship, that uh, there are times we feel this could be done in Italian much better because we could be all arms and waving and shouting and screaming, you know. But uh, yeah, they have their rows, but they, they get over them very fast. It's very hot and fiery and that's fine. They're a very good relationship in, in many ways, other than that, you know. And they're a good team, I think, as well. Once he has Una beside him, I think he's all right, because his head's elsewhere. If it's not horses, it's uh, making illegal whiskey or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. Six years of playing this guy, Donald Doherty, I don't know what he's like. They were good at robbing caviar from gangsters, but they couldn't hang a door. They're just unfigurable outable, the two of them. We did think that uh, perhaps in Ireland and England it would be very successful, but I don't think anyone imagined that it would travel so well, because we thought it was so provincial and all of that. But of course we forgot that every country has small villages with all these characters in them, so people can identify with them all over the world. But it's been a phenomenal success, which has been a huge surprise to us. Obviously it's a mixture of, of, of writing, cast, locations, the whole lot. It's just a matter of getting a whole lot of things right at the same time. And this got it right, 
with Kieran Prendival writing, um, I mean, he wrote series most of series six, and um, that was a great joy because he, having created the series, uh, just has this magic feel for Balakis Angel, and um, it was just the pleasure of some of those lines that you got to say, and it's just, I mean, it's the joy of an actor when you get wonderful writing, and uh, makes you look good when you've got good lines to say. But one thing I've never done is try to write to please other people or try to write to a particular audience, you'll fail miserably that way. You might as well just write what you want to write or as best you can. And if it finds an audience, that's great. We're very lucky here that we have a lot of very talented writers, very creative people, very fine actors. Um, the whole idea of ensemble acting is very uh, important to Irish actors. I think that's one of the, the reasons that Bally Kay is so successful too. A lot of the actors uh, come from theatre background and um, I think that stands to, to us. It's a nice one to play and it's because of the, um, I think, um, the input of all these different actors and, and, and the fact that the story changes. Um, like each episode is a complete story. So the next episode you're on to another story. So you don't feel you're kind of set in a groove, you know? And, and the fact that you, you don't know what you're going to be asked to do. And I think that the challenge is being able to go with uh, whatever comes up. I think firstly, because there are so many colorful characters that people can identify with. That's one thing. But I think secondly, there's a good mixture of uh, feel good factor um, and also serious storylines. And it's not offensive in any way, the program. So the whole family can sit down and watch it. It's a good Sunday night viewing before you go back to work. You can just forget about life and switch off. So there's a nice quirky quality to it. People can relax and enjoy it. You know, most of the time people do say, yeah, I enjoy it, wouldn't miss it. And like, but they, they'll always qualify by saying, yes, I go, I go to my grandmother's house and watch it with her. Because that's nice. <laughs> so, they wouldn't say they wouldn't stay in and have a beer and watch it. Now they go to their grannies. I like the characters, I like the storyline. It's good, easy to watch, very relaxing, keeps you tuned in. I think it's, it's a good storyline to it. Characters are good and it's the slice of Irish life. I think they're very natural and I think appeals to all age groups. You wanted to tune in next week to see how the characters got on. You got to like them and uh, I think that's what made it popular all over the world. You know, it's light-hearted but it's, it's not a farce. It's, it's a story of, you know, people in a, an imagined Irish village but there is a certain seriousness and, you know, some problems are treated reasonably seriously without being too heavy. It's about a group of people who uh, all look out for each other, who care about each other, and uh, also who have a sense of humour. The whimsy is, is very engaging, and also the fact that it's about community and community working. I think, um, you know, nowadays a lot of us are living in, in busy cities, and uh, there's not an awful lot of contact with people, and it brings you right back to that. There's a closeness there, or there's, there's a certain warmth at, at the heart of it. And, you know, uh, I think people are feeling very detached in, nowadays. And a sense of any community, I don't think it's, it's common to them now, not, not familiar to them rather. The whole programme is just nice and friendly, nice feel-good programme. It was just a real feel-good type of show. Just that it's down to earth and real as opposed to like um, American soap operas, which you can't really relate to, it's just normal stories, normal people. There are no car chases, it doesn't end with a shootout in a warehouse. There's no great major traumas, major violence, um, major upsets. We've, I think we've become so used to the formula. Uh, say with a cop show, with a medical drama, um, we know, we, we, our instincts are, we know where, where we think certain things are going to go. I think with Bally Kiss Angel, there still, there still is an element of surprise, you know. It doesn't always have to end on a happy ending with Bally Kiss Angel, and the, yeah, the, the, the actual setups are not, that, are not so readily familiar as good cop, bad cop, baddies, goodies, doctor, patient, you know, it's, not, it's a bit more diverse than that. I think people like that. beginning there was this this um, remarkable atmosphere uh, between cast and crew and um, everybody sort of 
felt they were contributing, no matter how big or how small it was. And uh, it, was, it was just a lovely one to work on. And that has kind of remained there right through to, 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 to um, the last series. And maybe it also coincided, I think, with the, um, the, the peace process had just started in, in, um, in Northern Ireland. And there was this marvellous thing of, of um, working with Northern Ireland crew and Dublin and uh, directors coming from London. And this wonderful, suddenly a freeing, you know, in, every, among, in, in everybody to, to um, you know, let's all get in here together and do this. I think everybody says it, it sounds a bit of a cliche and maybe a bit Pollyanna to say it, but there's a great family atmosphere on set and um, the crew are fantastic and uh, everybody enjoys working on it. So um, you look forward to getting up to go to work in the morning, no matter how early. <laughs> it's a great atmosphere on this show and um, I feel very jealous that I'm not a, a, a part of it. Um, but writers never are because um, as it's being shot, you're away writing. Um, that's the deal but it's a shame because uh, I love going down to Voca or to Bray uh, where the interiors are shot. It's a great atmosphere. I love it. We laugh a lot when we're not, we laugh like idiots when we're not working. How you doing? I'm Owen Rowe. I play Paul Dooley. Hello, I'm Owen Rowe. I'm Paul Dooley. No, I don't. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, Q Dog. It is the easiest job in the world working on Wally Cassandra. I've often said this because the people you're working with, and this is not, this is, you know, this is not being phony about it, it's true. It's very easy to work with the people who are there. It's, um, there's no, no preciousness. Um, none of the usual nonsense that you, you can run into if you're, as an, as an actor, with some, with some successful series or film or whatever. The entire cast and crew were just so fabulous to us and, um, I mean, Tony Doyle, it's sad to say that he's gone now, but um, he was particularly wonderful in, in making us feel welcome. And I had one scene which was a one-on-one -on -one with Tony, and uh, it's one of the great joys that I, I got to do that um, before he died, because I learned so much just in that one scene with him. And um, I, I described it to friends afterwards. It was like trying to reach your full height to, to get to his level of acting. and. Um, he was a wonderful bloke as well as, as a wonderful actor. His input was, 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 was so solid and he was such a help, I think, to the rest of us. I mean, he was just lovely to work with. And, and he, he would, um, you just felt you gave up your best when you're working with him in the scene. Like in in the, the, the show, he was my boss, but he was my boss when I worked as well. Like he was, like he was Joe Savino's boss too, because um, he was just someone who was, he was never tired of giving you advice. He'd never try to give you advice or how to exit a scene in such a way as to, as to hold camera for longer. He'd say to you, Joe, don't go out that way, go out that way. If you go out that way, your back's to camera. If you go out that way, camera's seeing you as you're going. And Roy Tommy, thanks. He always had, and he always had time for everybody. I think the Ballycus Angel cast and crew have become very close. Uh, we're very fortunate in that we have a lot of the crew um, all the way through all the series. Uh, we have the same drivers, we have a lot of the same office staff, we have a lot of the same makeup people uh, and that combined with the actors has made a very tight-knit community who have got to know each other very well. Come on, drop a few names there. Yeah? No. Tell us who you've driven. Placido Domingo. Yes. yes. Uh, Grace, Grace Kelly. Yes. Rock Hudson. Rock Hudson. Paul Newman. Paul Newman. You name it, I don't know. The Duke. But they didn't drama, yeah. Took the Duke. And uh, what about um, anyone famous? Not really, Robert Taylor. <laughs> My favourite scenes uh, always are when I'm out on some farm uh, or in a barn somewhere treating the animals. Uh, I love those days. I have many happy memories with Birdie Sweeney, who played the old farmer Eamon. Uh, treating his animals and one of my fondest memories of Birdie is when he had a scene where he was uh, sitting in the barn with his pigs playing the gramophone to them and talking to them and I just thought that that was magical stuff. I enjoyed the one where we did made the, made the pot chain. that was a good one uh, and I got a bit of fun out of that um, a, a tasting scene of the pot chain, which I enjoyed doing. Um, 
It wasn't really, it was only water, but it was the actual what I had to do was to be able to enjoy. The episode where, where they had the uh, the girls' night out, I think, prior to, to um, Neve's wedding, and Kathleen lost the head altogether on a couple of sherries and threw bollards into the, <laughs> into the, uh, the river, and uh, much to her own amazement, the next morning when she woke up, discovered she had done these things. I have a very strange but happy memory of a night shoot we did uh, somewhere around Wicklow um, uh, where we were around this campfire filming all night and up above us very clearly in the sky was the hale -Bopp Comet for the entire night and it, it was as clear as anything and um, that was magical that was very strange night but uh, very memorable. But with lots of mayhem with animals we had a goat last year and we had you know I had a bear about three seasons ago and we got to learn all kinds of things that you know you don't normally have to do. The very first scene shot on the very first day of the very first series it was up in Logalaw and it was the scene where I'm driving the truck and Frankie's with me in the confession box on the back and it falls off I think that was the first scene we did of the, of the, of the, the whole six years Day one, scene one, eight o'clock in the morning, look a lot. Good morning, I'm Joel Savino, how are you? <laughs> Evoca doubles up as, as Ballycus Angel, the town, and uh, we shoot all our ex exteriors there. Um, the exterior for Fitzgerald's pub is there, and um, for instance, the post office, the exterior there, uh, it, it actually hides the production offices inside. And then we do our interiors in Ardmore Studios in Bray. During the course of the filming, they'd be down in Avoca and they'd be shooting the main street, etc., etc. But when it came down to the, the interior of Fitzgerald's, they would come back into the studio and then the interior of some of the other, the priest's house and one or two other things like that. Yes, it can be quite a shock, I think, to the system for the fans when they go into Fitzgerald's in Avoca and they go in and uh, the interior is completely different. But I mean, it's loosely based on it, I think, when they originally did the set design. Um, they based it very much on the pub that was there, but there are huge differences as well, so it can throw them for six when they go inside. Most of the filming is done on actual farms. Um, the farmers are there. Um, sometimes we um, drive them out of their farms and their houses for the day while we film, and they have been very patient and put up with us. In the first couple of series, um, they had a vet on hand for me for any scenes I had to do where I was examining animals, um, obviously for their safety, but also to show me just the technicalities of how to hold a syringe or what gloves I should be wearing or um, how to hold an animal. Um, I remember there was a scene where I had to take a blood test from pigs, Eamon's pigs, and uh, I was told briefly how to handle the syringe, but I succeeded in stabbing myself through the finger. All Kathleen's um, scenes are done in the actual shop, Henley's, in uh, Avoca. And um, it's very interesting that uh, life goes on in the shop, even when the filming is going on. They, instead of coming in the front door, customers go around the back door and they're being served at uh, the end of the shop while the filming is going on, maybe at the beginning. It can be quite intense because um, we would do all the shop scenes now in one day, one or two days. So th that would be kind of a, a, quite an intense day. Well, then other days you mightn't have so much. You might be just part of the congregation in the in the church. A typical day. Well, if you were if you were filming all day, up at half six, pick up maybe quarter to seven, hair and makeup seven o'clock, seven fifteen, get something to eat, on set at eight, and if you were filming the whole day, you'd stop filming at eight in the evening. So it was a it was a 12-hour day, less an hour for lunch. You have to be ready to rock and roll, you know, when you come into work in the morning, you've got to have your scenes under your belt and um, be fairly confident about what you want to do with them because there isn't much time for rehearsing and uh, playing around with it. So um, it's quite a challenge from that point of view, but uh, one I really enjoy.
we get down on set and um, we maybe spend an hour in makeup and hair and whatever, and getting our costumes on. And then it's just a matter of waiting for our scenes. Um, usually, uh, we have to spend a lot of time before we get down to the main street uh, chatting to the fans who are also arrived there very early, uh, bus loads of them from God knows where all over the, the world, um, who are extremely nice and it's, it's always great fun to meet them because um, they love the show and they're always very interested in what's happening on a particular day. When I was supposedly pregnant, they all admired my bump. <laughs> and watched as it got bigger. The greatest feedback comes down in Evoke itself when, when, when we're filming down there and the, uh, the busloads of tourists uh, coming in to watch the filming and they're usually videoing us and making their own little film, so it's, it's rather bizarre, the whole thing. You know, you might be in the scene where you're walking, on, uh, you're the only person walking down the street in Evoke and you turn back and there could be anything up to 500 people behind the camera and they could be from four corners of the world, you know and they're all videoing in and snapping away. And you say, yeah, this, this show really is popular, all right? Well, I want to go and see Valley Cathedral because it's a real place, isn't it? Yes. I came to Avoca today to see uh, Valley Cathedral and to see all the places that I've seen on the television show. We came here to see Valley Cathedral, and we wouldn't have came here only for Valley Cay because we watch it every week back home. I came from Portsmouth in England today um, obviously influenced by Bally Kay to come and see the place. It's such a fabulous place. I actually, I came here because of the show. Uh, actually, myself and eight other people. It was just an idea from seeing the show so often. And everything looked so good and so, you know, you just had to be there, you just had to see it. And uh, we started talking about it and playing around with the idea and one thing led to another and soon there was like nine people that wanted to come here. <laughs> so we've spent almost the last two weeks touring around Ireland just because of seeing Valley Kiss Angel. I came to Avoca because I was coming to Ireland and Valley Kiss Angel is one of my favourite television shows in Australia and it seems like quite a nice place too. It's fascinating hearing how far people have travelled, you know, I mean, we've had people travelling from Australia, from England, from America, just to see the town where Ballycas Angel is filmed, and uh, it's a great thrill that they're that keen on the show. Uh, a honeymoon couple came and spent their entire two-week honeymoon in Avoca. Uh, I don't know how they put up with it, watching us film, and I think appeared finally as extras in, in, in uh, whichever episode we were, we were doing at the time. Remarkable. This show really sparked something. <laughs> it was a very daunting joining a series that I knew the fans were very fond of the people who had been there before me. And, um, you know, you're kind of a bit nervous about will you fit in, um, particularly, you know, with the audience. And um, the feedback's just been wonderful. Thank God. <laughs> I won't forget lightly the international response I got when, um, when I killed a sumter, um, when, uh, when I fried her in the cellar. Got some ferocious emails and letters from people saying, how could you, how dare you? But she had to die. I wanted to put pressure on the priest. I wanted to give him something really dramatic to chew on. And it seemed to me that having committed at last to the woman he adored, to have her snatched away from him at the last moment, um, gave us some mighty conflict. And uh, to have the pair of them leave town on a bus, I thought would have been a bit there. Sorry, I can't help it. It's the way I am, you know. To tell you why she had to die, actually, the um, uh, Dervra Kerwin, who plays her, um, is a friend of mine, I hope. I haven't seen her in a long time, but I like her. I think she's great. But she won this award once in London. And uh, before she won the award, she says, Kieran, she said, if I win this award, your name will be first upon my lips. And I said, well, that's great, Dervra, but I don't think you will. And she did. And she delivers this oration. And it's going on and on. And I'm thinking, you're leaving it a bit late now, uh, Dervla, you know. And she's thanking the people who park her car when she goes to the television centre. Um, she finishes the speech thanking, I can't remember who. And I'm thinking, hmm. And she looks at me and she goes, oh, God. So when she sits down, I said to her, you realise, of course, Dervla, I'll have to kill you for this. And I did. Ballycus Angel has had a huge effect on Avoca and actually the whole of Wicklow. We film also in Enniskerry, um, Lugalaw, beautiful uh, location, and, and the Guinness Estate. 
the amount of tour buses coming through Wicklow close is phenomenal, travelling to Ballycus Angel. The first year we were there, nobody knew who we were. We uh, filmed six episodes in 1995 and uh, it was a very quiet village and uh, it has just changed out of all recognition. Uh, tourists come from Australia, from uh, the north of Ireland, from England, sometimes from New Zealand, from Canada and um, uh, it's a very busy place these days. I remember two years ago being sitting out on the steps outside here while we were shooting and um, in 15 minutes there were seven buses passed me by. And that's 500 people in 15 minutes. We're now just passing through the beautiful little village of Avoca, which has now become better known as Ballycus Angel. The film set for that wonderful soap that we're all watching feverishly every Sunday evening here in Ireland and other places all over the world. And as a result of this soap being so popular, it has drawn thousands and thousands of visitors to this beautiful little village of Avoca. The more the, you know, the series went on and got more successful, uh, the more tourists came down to Avoca to see where Bellicus Angel was shot. And we saw the number of coaches basically quadruple. I mean, it went from a couple of coaches a day going to Avoca hand weavers to easily 10, 20, 30 coaches. And as you can see, the town isn't that big. And parking was an enormous problem. It still is quite a problem. And I think that's where um, some of the negative feelings started. This is, it's been good and bad. Um, in the sense that people, the, 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 the town has, has thrived as it would, as a, as a place of uh, people who are fans of the show go there, will spend the day there, they spend money there. It's not going to do the town any, any harm. Um, however, uh, it's a small place. People have to get to and from their work who live there. Um, so if we're there and we're, we're bunging up the place, and, and it, it, it doesn't, uh, it creates a lot of stress. And, and I can understand why they might feel a bit uh, angry with the, the, us and what we do. It's had a huge impact on the village. And I must say, 99% for the good. The first episode of Balakis Angel went out on the 10th of February, 1996. And on the 11th and 12th of February, and ever since, we've had visitors by the busload come to the village. There are uh, souvenir shops in the town that weren't here. Uh, there's more traffic. Some of the people are beginning to complain about that now. It's brought a massive influx of tourists in the area. Good and bad in it. We've got traffic problems if they could be addressed by the local councils. But uh, other than that, everyone seems to be quite happy with the whole thing. I think, generally speaking, the majority of people are okay. I mean, some people have been put out because of the volume of traffic coming through. Trying to go about their business has been a little bit of a problem. But if, you know, you've got to balance the two between the outweighing the volume of people and the way we've been put on the map, not just for, with the Voca, but overall. Um, in Ireland. I mean, it's definitely been the best holiday program that's ever done in this country. A very odd time we do have mass in my sitting room on a weekday. But they're very obliging if we have funerals or a wedding or anything. And their um, locations manager comes and sees me and looks at the diary to make sure we'll have no irate mothers or brides, you know. That's one you could get into terrible trouble there you know, with a uh, mother of a bride. There are times when we feel a bit guilty because uh, we've brought this upon the town of Avoca and they've been so good natured about the whole thing. Um, and it has just grown and grown. I mean, it's, uh, we're stopping the traffic in order to shoot a scene. But also then you've got like, uh, oh, we have to wait for the seven tour buses to, to drive through. As the series became more and more popular, and as, as a result, Avoca became more popular for tour buses, they suddenly found it became more and more difficult to even do some of the exteriors down there. So what they did last season was shot some of the exteriors of Fitzgerald's on the stage, rather than try and do it down Avoca. So success has its problems at times. Very quietly, shooting this time. Well, it's transformed the entire place. I mean, for instance, without mentioning any names, you know, one man who had one business here just before we opened and now has six businesses here, and that was because he sort of 
saw the potential when the first few tourists arrived. About 80% of the guests at the moment would be uh, fans of Ballycus Angel and then during filming we have the cast and the crew. Thanks to them, you know, because a lot of the small business around here, they wouldn't be able to survive. I think the positives certainly seem to have outweighed the, the negatives. It's a landmark, it really is a landmark. It's a, a place that you can identify with. People come to the airport and they ask where is Ballycus Angel. Not Volker, I must say, uh, Ballycus Angel. It's had such an effect also that people now sell their houses around Avoca uh, with the address advertised as Ballycus Angel, uh, which actually doesn't exist, truth be told. Well, here we are, Avoca. This is where we shot Ballycus Angel. You can see Fitzgerald's pub down there, formerly the Fountain Bar. This is where we used to drink. Well, not really. We drank in the studio. It's where myself and Donald used to sit, sometimes. If we were filming over there, if the camera was this way, and we all pull the people. And then when they turn the camera around, we'd have to move all the people over there. So we were constantly herding people all over the place. The episode where Kathleen's house burnt down was filmed here. And what the crew did, they built a pretend house connected to that one. So what actually burnt down was all here. Now, Tony owned the pub, and as Bally Kay got bigger and bigger, he bought all of this. You can even see that over there, Wise Boys, Bally Kiss Angel discount store. He has things in there, lollipops with Bally Kiss Angel written on them. But this was the street where we shot a lot of the scenes of the... Oh, basically Liam and Donald tearing down the road in the truck or whatever. We shot a lot of the shots. The, the, the shots would normally start up the top and would tear down here. And I half expect to see somebody... I half expect like to see Birdie, God love him, or Tony, God rest his soul, or... Frankie come down the road in a truck or, you know, I, I, it's very strange, it really is, because I've never been down here other than to play the role, you know. I'd never been down here before I did it. That's the real police station of Avoca, but the one where we filmed was way down the other side, down and opposite the pub. There's the church. While we'd be filming, this pub used to have signs on it. That would all be filled in, and the windows would be filled in, and there'd be different cardboard things here. Um, and it was a betting shop. And there was a lot of scenes shot here. Of, um, I still see Frankie and myself having a chat here about his girlfriend and him throwing pebbles into the sea, and himself and Neil Tobin doing a scene where they both threw pebbles into the sea. Just before the credits roll, or when the credits roll, that. It was shot coming in here by helicopter, I presume. And they come right down along here, take in the spire on the, the church. You wouldn't think you could get so much out of something so small. We were very shocked to hear the news that it had been cancelled. We had been looking forward to the cast and crew arriving in the middle of May and then the news broke that they had decided to exit and uh, we were shocked. I thought we'd get this year out of it, but I honestly didn't expect to get next year out of it. I thought this would be our final fling. It, a, a bit of a shock, but I think, you know, not entirely unexpected. And um, from an acting point of view, after six years in one show, you sort of do need to move on. And a lot of us were kind of going, well, I'm not going to jump till it's over, but um, it's sort of a relief in a way to, to have this, the decision made for you, you know. I was disappointed, oh, yeah. Yeah. but at the same time, um, these things have their shelf life. They can't go on forever. And um, much as it hurts and all that, you wouldn't want to be doing the same thing for 20 years. At least I wouldn't. Um, although, if it kept going on, I would have kept on doing it. I don't know I would. The idea was getting a little tired, 
and I think we'd begun to repeat ourselves. And uh, that, that's TV death, I guess, if, if, if you do that. So um, uh, that's complete conjecture on my part. From an actor's point of view, it's seven, it was seven months' work a year, and it was guaranteed. It was there. I have to be honest. Anyone will tell you that. So that's what I miss. I miss the fact that I won't, you know, I don't know what I'm doing now for the next six months. I don't know. A month ago, I knew what I was doing for the next six months. Now I don't. But professional actor, you know, gun for hire. Say, <laughs> We just heard over there, like you said, that it's going to be cancelled here shortly. And that's just like really too bad <laughs> because I think it's a great show. Artmore Studios had been booked for the summer and a lot of people had been booked for the summer and everybody was kind of expecting the crew pretty soon again. You know, I think by the end of, of June they were expecting to come down here again. So needless to say, I'd say some people are relieved, but I'd say a lot of people will be sad to see them going. I mean, they, they welcomed them here and they were glad to have them here, you know. I think the village is divided in two about the fact that it's gone. Because one half of the place, people would have made an awful lot of money from tourists and from selling all sorts of odds and ends connected to Ballycay. But the other side of the coin was that the farming community down here, they were constantly being held up in traffic on shooting days and maybe they're trying to move silage from away down there to away over here and they're stuck in traffic and by the time they get down to the bridge they have to stop again so it was holding up a lot of people they couldn't get anywhere because it's very the roads are very tight around here I will miss them yeah because with a few of them you know I was getting on very well and and it's not only just spending money into the business it was uh, good friends as well so how have you been? Oh, I've been great. Will you miss us? Of course we miss you. We miss ah, the camaraderie and all the fun. And... I know. It's so, a loss, isn't it? Yeah. It's a loss, but maybe you'll be back. It will be missed um, in the summertime now, when the children get their school holidays and there's no cast and no crew in the village. I'd, I'd say they're relieved that we're not going to be there actually filming because it is terribly disruptive. But I'd imagine they'll have tourists for quite a while to come That's on right. the strength of, of Bally Kane. Give us a kiss. <laughs> now it is really you, isn't it? It is really it is you. you. It is you. <laughs> well, it's a wonderful show. Yeah. We really miss it. Well, thanks very much. Great. And we're a big fan of the show, yeah? Absolutely incredible. Yeah, from Hawaii, actually. I was living there for four years. Did you get it in Hawaii? Yep, on PBS there. It was great. Wow. It was excellent, yeah. So. Was it big over there? Um, you know what? Pretty much. A lot of people were watching it, you know? yeah. And of course, everyone that you know, I talked to it. It's this great show, and you have to check it out, Valley Cafe Angel. <laughs> but it was great, and now to actually be here and to see everything, it's just like wonderful. Everyone knows the show is finished, but there's a lot, of, a lot of tourists down here today. And this is only, what, April? I guarantee you by June, July, they'll be all over the place again, hundreds of them, because the show is still going on worldwide. <laughs> Thanks. Super. This is great. This is awesome. You just made the whole trip. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> A lot of the people of Avoca um, are extras in many of the scenes, so if you look back through old episodes, you'll see the same familiar faces in the background, and uh, we've become very close to them as well because we've got to know them over the course of nearly seven years now. It's something we'll have now for years to come, and it's something we'll be able to tell our grandchildren about and in generations. It'll always be the location of Balakis Angel, so people will remember that and when the children grow up they'll remember the summers they spent working as extras and just hanging around the village to see what was going on because it was full of activity. We all grew very, very close. Everybody knew everybody else. There was no prima donnas. No one messed around with anybody. We got the job done as quick as we could and tried to have a good time doing it. Um, and I think that shows, I think that shows in the, in the, 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 in the, the series, you know. Um, it's great work. It really is good work. It's, I mean, it's, it's top-rate television. If you're trying to make something that people will enjoy watching, it's important to enjoy um, the process of making it as well. It's been really, really hard to, to, to leave. 
it's a pleasure to work on Paddy Kay. A really good crew and cast and everyone. It's like a big family, really, which sounds really cliche, but it's true. Everyone in Paddy Kay got to be really big friends, and that's it's kind of nice. It was good, gentle, all round family entertainment. You could cry a bit, you laughed a lot. Uh, there was a beginning, a middle, and an end to each one of the episodes. The characters were recognisable and lovable, and you even loved to hate some of them. I think they did have been the maddest things they could possibly have done, you know. They looked after a bear. They went ballooning. I mean, they've done it all, really, you know. Tobin is a past master of being a priest. He should have been a bishop. <laughs> I can't tell you how, what, a, what an enjoyable experience it is. I mean, writing often isn't. You sit there alone in a room, staring at a blank screen until your forehead bleeds, as uh, somebody said before me. But that's often what it's like. It, it wasn't like this this time. Uh, it was just so easy, or it felt to me so easy. Perhaps that's a bad sign, but uh, um, I loved it, yeah, I loved it. See you all the best. Cheers.